Welcome back to the MIT Category Seminar. Today we have Aigil Greshel, who's going to talk about categorical probability. So in particular on the work he's been doing together with Tobias Fritz on Markov categories and on how you can prove using Markov categories some of the basic theorems in probabilities and constructions, such as the Kolmogorov extension theorem and zero one laws of Kolmogorov and Hewitt Savage. Yeah. It's really exciting because it's one of the most interesting approaches of categorical probability because you can actually prove theorems of probability this way in a purely formal way using string diagrams. Um, hello, Igil. Uh, hey. The mic is all yours. So just uh, for questions, feel free to write in the chat, either on Zoom or Zulip or uh, on YouTube. In case you want to follow, here is the link to the paper who's published in Compositionality. And please uh, go ahead, Igil. Yes, so uh, thank you all for uh, showing up. Uh, and as Paolo said, I'm going to talk about uh, well, uh, this paper that, uh, well, I guess was published in Compositionality uh, in August this year. It's actually written mostly uh, in like last year and in January. Uh, so this is a bit old for me. Uh, so maybe if I mess something up, it's because I haven't looked at it seriously for a while. Um, but yeah, it's about proving these things called zero to one laws using just category theory and it's joint work with Tobias Fritz. Okay, so here's just a summary of the talk. Uh, first, I'll spend a little while introducing uh, the basic framework that we're gonna be using, which is this thing called Markov categories. I'll talk about how to do probability theory in that setting, how to, how to make sense of various sort of basic notions from probability theory. Um, and define those in terms of this the structure of these categories. Uh, then I'll sort of address this maybe the basic question of this paper, or like the most, you know, the, the basic contribution, which is how do we make sense of infinite tensor products in such a category? Uh, and then I will state and prove a categorical version of Kolmogorov's zero to one law. Uh, and so maybe if there's time, I'll also do. Uh, Hewitt Savage. Savage's zero to one law. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's the, the basic plan. Uh, so let's uh, get started with this. Okay, so the framework is something called Markov categories. So what is that? So a Markov category is a symmetric monoidal category uh, which we're going to write, we're going to call C, we're going to write the tensor product as, you know, a tensor and the unit's going to be, be called I. And then, so on top of that, you want a commutative co-monoid on each object. So each object is equipped with uh, a map, which we call a copy X, which is the, the co-multiplication from X to X tensor X. And in the string diagrams, we're going to write the copy as just a bullet with two arrows, two lines coming out of it and uh, the lead map from X to the unit. So this is the co-unit. And uh, that's gonna be this, uh, you know, bullet with nothing coming out of it. And so, uh, you know, you can tell that my string diagrams go from bottom to top. So time is running upwards in these string diagrams. Uh, yeah. And yeah, over here, I've written out the axioms of a, a commutative co-monoid, just if you didn't, don't know what that means. It just means if you copy something and delete one of the sites, then it's the same thing as just doing nothing. If you copy something and then uh, swap the sites, it's the same thing as if you just copied something and didn't swap. And if you copy something and then copy one of the sites, it's the same thing as if you copied something and then copy the other side. Um, Okay, so to satisfy these things, and you should think of the objects as like some sort of spaces. So maybe they're topological spaces or maybe just sets or maybe measurable spaces or something like that. And the, you know, the tensor you should think of as some sort of like product space. And the copy is, you know, just the, the co-diagonal, which, which, sorry, the diagonal, which, uh, you know, takes X to X comma X and the delete is just the unique map to a one point space. Um, and indeed, uh, I should be terminal. Uh, so this should be the unique map to I. Uh, and this, 
monoidal structure should be something I'm just going to call compatible with the symmetric monoidal structure. So it means that a bunch of diagrams should commute, uh, including, for example, this one. So the, the monoidal structure in X tends to Y is, uh, sorry, I'm struggling a bit with my tools here. The monoidal structure on X tends to Y is the same as the one you get if you use the combine the monoidal structures on X and Y in this way. And of course, when I say monoidal, I mean co-monoidal. Um, but crucially, uh, we don't have, but we don't have naturality. So we don't necessarily have that, you know, this copy is a natural transformation from, uh, from, from X to, to X tensor X. So this is, that's very important. Um, so that's why this is not the same thing as a category with products, uh, but I'll get, say more about that in a bit. Okay, so this is basically uh, the uh, framework we're gonna board in. Uh, here are some examples. So the, the most important example and the example which sort of met, motivates the whole theory is the category we call stock. And so this is for stochastic. And so the objects of stock are measurable spaces. Um, so spaces equipped with a sigma algebra and a map from X to Y is a so-called Markov kernel. So that's a map from the space X to the space of probability measures on Y. Um, and the tensor product is gonna be the Cartesian product, but it's not Cartesian. Like this is not a, a categorical product. This doesn't have the universal property of the product in this category stock, but it, it, you know, we're still gonna write it like this uh, when defining it, because of course it is the, you know, in the cat, it is the product of the two sets equipped with the product sigma algebra. Um, yeah, and the 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 co and the copy and delete maps are you know what you think they are. The copy is the map from x to x cross x, which sends the point x to the point x comma x. Uh, then another important example is uh, fin stock or fine stock, so finite stochastic. Uh, so this is the subcategory of stock. We only take the finite sets. Um, another important one is one called uh, Borel stock. So this is the subcategory of stock. We only take the so-called standard Borel spaces, which are measurable spaces, which are sort of nicely behaved. If you don't know what standard Borel is, this is just some sort of regularity condition, which makes sure that you know, like measure theory isn't too weird uh, for these spaces. And the, the final example that I'm going to talk about is if C has products, then of course we can always make it into a monoidal category just by making the product the monoidal uh, product. And uh, in that case, you know, there's a unique markup structure on this Cartesian monoidal category. Um, and so the, the, the general like thing tying these examples together is that you should think of a markup category as consisting of spaces and maps with randomness between the spaces. So maps that can depend on some sort of external source of, of randomness or maps that are noisy in some sense. Um, okay. So, well, I said that, you know, this is like the framework that we're going to be doing probability theory in. So how can we do that? So now for what I'm going to do now is try to explain how we can make sense of certain notions from probability theory uh, or like certain probabilistic notions using like just the structure that I've described. So, you know, from now on, you know, C is some markup category. Like, and probably for the rest of the talk, this is just, you know, some markup cat and, and everything, all the diagrams that I'm writing are diagrams in C. Um, so we say a map F is deterministic if this diagram, uh, or if this equality holds. So in other words, if F is natural with respect to the co-multiplication. Um, and so let's think about what this means. This says that if you, so on the left-hand side, we have if you, you know, use F on some input and copy the output. So I compute, you know, F of X, and then I write that down two times. Then on the uh, right-hand side, we have, well, I'm gonna take some input 
I'm going to copy that input and feed it to F twice. And then I'm going to write out the two outcomes that I get. So if that's the same thing, it must be because you know F always gives the same uh, output given the same input, which is sort of intuitively what it means to be deterministic. Um, so we have a, a subcategory of deterministic maps because composing deterministic maps gives a deterministic map. And uh, yeah, so there's a subcategory which we're going to call C debt. And in the uh, in the case where C is Cartesian, so in the case where the tensor product is just a product, then of course, you know, this co-multiplication is the, uh, you know, the, the diagonal map and everything is natural with respect to, to that. Like that's really a natural transformation from X to the product of X and X. Um, so any map is deterministic in that sense. It, like all maps are, are natural with respect to that. Um, so this means that there's no randomness. So you, you should think of these Cartesian uh, monoidal categories as sort of like degenerate mark of categories where there's, you know, it's a spaces and maps with randomness, but there's actually no randomness in any of the maps. Like, yeah. and so for that reason, you can sort of think like the failure of this inclusion to be full, uh, like, or the failure of the tensor product to be Cartesian is somehow measuring how much randomness we're allowing in our category. And so if that's what, where the randomness lives in some vague sense. Um, okay, so that's what it means for a map to be deterministic. Um, and maybe I should just say this, like if you interpret this in, for instance, uh, fine stock, uh, these are exactly like the, uh, the normal functions between or like up to bijection. So fine stock that is isomorphic as, cate as a category to the category of finite sets. Uh, and there are similar results in other cases. So it's the case for uh, the full category stock is a bit weird because there are some sort of like fake deterministic maps that aren't actually, don't come from measurable maps. Uh, but, but in general, you sort of the deterministic maps are what you expect them to be. Okay. Um, so let's uh, move on. Uh, and talk about another thing. So if we have a map like this, so this is a map that takes in some input A and produces two outputs X and Y, which of course are random. So this is some sort of parameterized joint distribution over X and Y, um, over X and Y. And we say that X and Y are independent given uh, the A. So and we write it like this, X independent of Y given A if uh, the following equality holds. So uh, down here, we have just you know this map where we generate X and Y based on A. But another thing we could do is we could take our A and copy it. And then we could run the you know, generate X and Y procedure once uh, and throw away the Y. So delete whatever Y we got out, keep the X, then run the procedure again, and this time keep the Y and use those two x's and y's. And you know, it's clear that on the right side here, then the only, uh, like the only sort of allowed correlation between, the only connection between the x that we get and the y that we get is gonna be you know, the fact that they were generated using the same a. So if we know the a, then learning what this x was tells us nothing about this y because they were generated, well, from the same a, but apart from that, they were generated independently. Um, so this is like, and on the other hand, if they are generated independently, then clearly, you know, if you generate them twice, you're going to get, or if you, if you run the procedure twice, then you're going to get the same overall distribution as long as you use the same input. Um, so this is what it means to be an independent, uh, map. And again, this, like this recovers like usual notion of independence. In this actually just works straight up in uh, in stock. Uh, that you get a pro like if this is true, then the measure the probability measure that you have on the, the product space is going to be a product measure. Um, so yeah, just like whenever more or less whenever I say like define some notion that already has a meaning in probability theory, it's gonna be the same thing. 
Um, okay, so this is what independence means. Uh, and those are basically the only ones that are gonna come up in this talk. So I'm not gonna keep going on about this, but you can make sense of like a lot of other uh, notions in, uh, in this sense. So you can make sense of conditional distributions. Uh, so you know, if you have a distribution on X and Y, you can get a map from X to Y, which uh, like is the con conditional distribution of Y given X. And so there's another notion of conditional independence which you know comes from this sense of conditional distributions, and you know they interact in the reasonable way that you would expect. Uh, but if you know what a sufficient statistic is, this is an important notion from statistics. You can make sense of that in this setting. Uh, and we've just put a new paper on the archive uh, where about this thing called informativeness preorder. So if you have two different experiments you can perform, then you can ask which of them is going to provide me more information about you know, the thing that I'm measuring uh, than the other. And you can define that, again, purely algebraically uh, in this setting. And dot, 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 this means to imply that you can you know, define a ton of stuff uh, just using this very basic structure. OK, but again, that this stuff isn't really going to come up in this talk, so I'm not going to keep going on about it. OK, so now uh, I'm going to talk about the classical version of Kolmogorov's zero to one law. So this is a classical, very classical theorem in probability theory. It's actually as old as measure theory, theoretic probability. Uh, Kolmogorov proved a version of this theorem in the original book where he introduced the axioms of probability theory. Um, so this is as classical as it can possibly get. Uh, and it says as follows, or like the, the version that I'm gonna be working with says as follows. So I have some random variables vi uh, and they're all independent. And then I have an event E which depends uh, measurably on the vi. So formally what this means is that E is in the sigma algebra generated by these v's. Um, and what you should think of here is that like so VI, e, whether E happens or not, is determined by the values of the, the VI the, of my random variable. And it depends, like it's, you know, it's a measurable subset of the, the, the sigma algebra, uh, the product sigma algebra on like the product of all those uh, variables. So it doesn't depend in a like too pathological way, but you know, but if, if you don't know uh, like, if you, if you don't know what this means, then that probably doesn't make sense to you either. So just think of it as like uh, a, a nice event, which depends only on the, 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 v, the Vs. All right, and I'm also gonna need the assumption that E is independent of any finite subset of the Vs. So, you know, V1 up to Vn for any like finite number N uh, is independent of E. So like if I learn the you know, the, the first n values of the v's, that tells me nothing about e, no matter how big n is. Um, so an example of this is like, you know, e could be, does the sequence vi converge? So this is, of course, I mean, it depends only on the values of the vi. Uh, I'm not gonna argue that it's in the sigma algebra, but it wouldn't be hard, too hard to show that if, I wanted to, um, but of course, if I only learn finitely many values of the VIs, you know, that's not going to tell me anything about whether they converge or not. Um, convergence is only like a property of, you know, sort of the tail uh, of the of the sequence. Um, okay, so given all those assumptions, then the probability that E happens is either zero or one. So either it always happens or it never happens. So there's no like in between. Possible. Okay, so we want to prove this in like we want to figure out what the right version of this is for for markup categories and then prove it. Um, and right away we see a, this, there's a serious problem uh, making sense of this in markup categories, namely that we have infinitely many variables. And like, what does it mean? How do you have infinitely many variables in a markup category? That's not really clear because you, you can only take infinite products. 
sorry, you can only take finite products. So to do that, you need a notion of uh, infinite products. Um, you, we need to make sort of make sense of like, you know, where is this collection of variables going to live? Um, and, and, you know, that's a sort of a general thing in probability theory, almost everything is about like infinite limits, like the, the probability theory that you can do sort of, you know, using only finite sets is sort of like, I mean, it's uh, maybe sort of of practical interest to like, you know, statisticians and whatever, but sort of theoretically, it's very trivial. Nobody who's doing like probability theory cares about uh, finite sets. So, or like finite sequences or whatever. So this is really sort of like to capture any interesting theorems of probability theory, we need to, to, to get this in there. Okay, um, so here's how to define infinite products. Uh, so we have some, you know, collection of uh, objects in our Markov category C, and let's say they're indexed by J. Of course, if this set J is a finite set, then there's no problem defining uh, the tensor product as, you know, well, so you just tensor the objects together. Of course, there's a question about like where you put the parentheses, uh, but it's well-defined up to canonical isomorphism. That's all I really care about. Um, so, but what about if J is infinite? Then, you know, we can't get there by this, you know, iterated procedure. Um, so the obvious idea that you can use is to take the limit. Um, so you take, you know, for each finite set, you have uh, each finite subset of, of J, you have a tensor product of those XJs. Uh, and then you take, so if you have, you know, F prime, a subset of F, then you get a map from the tensor over F to the tensor over F prime uh, by deleting all the coordinates that aren't in like by using the delete map on all the coordinates that aren't in F prime. Um, and so you can take the limit over that big diagram. And, you know, so uh, this has the, for instance, the advantage that if J is actually a finite set, then this limit just degenerates. Then there's a, you know, uh, an initial object in this category, namely uh, J itself. And so you get just the finite tensor product. So that's good. That's like the first sanity check that the infinite tensor product of a finite number of things is just the, the normal finite tensor product. Um, right. So it turns out for reasons that I'm not going to get into, they sort of have to do with some, you know, two things of proof. Maybe we'll see this a bit later. Uh, this is not quite enough. Like in general, Markov categories can be very weird and this limit can be very poorly behaved. Um, so we need to impose some further conditions on this limit. Um, so first of all, we want it to be preserved by the tensor product. So if I take this limit and tensor it with some other object Y, then that is the limit over these, like the tensor tensorings of, you know, the finite tensors with Y. Um, and the uh, second thing is that the maps, from, so, you know, whenever you have a limit, you get a map uh, from, uh, the, from the, the limit to uh, the, you know, the things that it's a limit of, and these should all be deterministic. Um, and so just to make it clear, like the, the motivation here is like that, like for this, you know, this action seems a bit weird, but like the, the main reason it should be plausible is that this is true if this is an infinite product. Like the, you know, if, you, if you're in a Cartesian setting, then, uh, you know, these tensor products are just gonna be normal Cartesian products. And then this limit is gonna be preserved by taking the product with anything else. Uh, of course, this setting, this second condition is uh, very strange. Uh, we can't really make sense of that by reference to the Cartesian setting, uh, but this is required to make the, uh, like to make sure that the, this limit is defined, like well-defined up to deterministic isomorphism. So in, in a general Markov category, you can have sort of stochastic isomorphisms, which are very strange and we don't really understand what they mean, uh, but definitely like any two objects that are, the same should have a deterministic isomorphism between them. 
and you need this to, to make that happen. Okay, but if it satisfies these two conditions, then we'll call this limit a Kolmogorov product and just write it as you know, the tensor over J. And this is of course gonna be well-defined now up to deterministic isomorphism by this, uh, by an argument that I'm not gonna go into. Uh, and uh, yeah, and this is gonna be like well-defined enough that we'll just make a choice and don't, not worry about it. Um, yes. So just uh, a few examples. Um, if we have a Cartesian monoidal category, then the Komogorov products are just infinite products, which of course might not exist. But if they exist, they're Komogorov products. And if they don't exist, then the Komogorov products don't exist. And I mean, this is pretty uh, like, this is you know another sanity check that tells us this definition isn't too stupid. Um, of course, this is also sort of a way of motivating the limit definition, right? It's a way of building up the infinite products from the finite products, you know, in the sense where we know what the infinite product is supposed to be. Um, okay, so the category stock does not have all Kolmogorov products. Uh, it doesn't even have, well, you know, the first thing you expect is that, you know, uh, maybe you need to assume that we're talking like you're taking countable products because, you know, countable things are important in probability theory, but doesn't even have all countable ones. Uh, and that's just because the Kolmogorov extension theorem is false in general. So uh, the Kolmogorov extension theorem is a theorem from probability theory, which is basically uh, the existence part of the universal property of the limit for uh, Kolmogorov products. Um, so yeah, uh, and that's, you know, you need some assumptions on your measures to, to make that true. Um, and if you try to, you know, you try to, you know, prove the, or like ask whether the universal property of the Kolmogorov product holds in a setting where, you know, those assumptions aren't true, then it's not true. Um, so it doesn't have, stock doesn't have all Kolmogorov products. Okay, well, that's a bit of an issue because I want to use Kolmogorov products to do, you know, to, to, to prove this Kolmogorov or to state this Kolmogorov tier one law. So, you know, what can we do about that? So that's why we invented this category Borel stock, uh, which has all countable Kolmogorov products. So basically if your, your measure spaces are standard Borel, then the Kolmogorov extension theorem always holds. And then you can always use it to, to prove that the universal property uh, is, holds. And these Kolmogorov products are what you expect, like they're sort of the, you know, the, the, the product, the infinite Cartesian product of the underlying measure spaces. All right. Um, so with all that done, we can finally start, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I forgot about this slide. So we need one last thing to, before we can get to the Kolmogorov theorem because, you know, Kolmogorov theorem is about uh, an infinite family of independent variables. So we need to make sense for about in sense of independence in the setting of like, you know, an infinite family of variables. So if we have a map from A to an infinite uh, tensor product, then we're gonna say all the XJs are independent given A, and we're gonna write this like this because we can't write, you know, uh, a turnstile between all the XJs because they're infinitely many, um, but we're gonna write it like this, the XJs are independent given A. If for each finite projection, um, then we have sort of the, the, the F airy generalization of the, the, the independence action we saw before. So if I you know, use P and then use the finite projection, so now I have F different copies, you know, X, X, F different Xs. That's the same thing as if I copy P F times, sorry, copy the input F times, uh, you know, use P on each of those and then keep only, you know, the, the first and the second up to the F component. Uh, so this is, you know, the, this is like the F airy version of the action we saw before for two output variables. Uh, and so we could also say for all finite subsets, uh, you know, those coordinates, the coordinates in that subset are independent. Um, Okay, yeah, and of course I didn't write this on the slide, but the F should be finite here. So F finite. 
otherwise this diagram doesn't make any sense. Okay, so that's just what it means to be, uh, you know, for an infinite family to be of measures to be independent. It means that like all finite subfamilies are independent. Okay, so now we can get to uh, the theorem. So this is the a theorem due to uh, V and Tobias, uh, which is the categorical version of uh, Komogorov zero to one law. So we take an infinite set J. Um, and yes, so we take infinite set J and we say, actually it doesn't need to be infinite, but if it's finite, then this is trivial. Uh, then we let XJ be an, you know, a family of objects in our category indexed by J so that the, their Kolmogorov product exists. Um, and then we let P be some map from some object A to this Kolmogorov product. Um, and it should satisfy this independence assumption, which I just explained. So uh, the, you know, it's a, we, we, th we should think of this as like the joint distribution of our infinite family of variables. Um, and there sh they should be independent given A. Okay, so then let S be a map from this infinite tensor product to T uh, and it should be deterministic. And, you know, this is like our E from the theorem from before. This is the, like, this is a map that takes you know, the values of our variables and tells us whether the event happened or not. But here's just the general map, except that it should be deterministic. Um, okay, so assume for all uh, finite subsets, the map which, so the map we have down here, which like generates the, the variables and then, on, you know, take, you know, copy the variables on one hand, compute T based on them. On the other hand, keep only finitely many of them then the finite collection of variables should be independent of the T given the A. So this is the you know, independence assumption from Komogorov's uh, zero to one law. Then this composite SP from A to T is deterministic. Um, okay, so let's prove that. And the proof turns out to be almost trivial uh, because basically we've baked like the the you know the definition of a Kolmogorov product makes this like super easy. Um, <clears throat> so let's see the proof. Okay, so first I claim that in this diagram. So this is the diagram from before, right? Like this is this diagram, uh, except that I don't have this finite projection anymore. So the the diagram which just generates the variables you know, spits the variables out and also spits S of the variables out. The variables are independent of T given A. So this basically says that, you know, the, the, the T is independent of all the variables, not just the finite subsets in, in our sense. Um, okay, so what the hell does that mean? Uh, to see this, I have to show that this map equals this map. That's you know, if you rewrite it a little bit, that's the definition of independence in this case. Um, so here you use the co-monoid action, actions a little bit to rewrite uh, a diagram, but I have to show that these two diagrams are equal. Um, and these two diagrams are describing maps from A into the limit of finite subsets of J. So I guess finite here, like finite subsets of J tensor F XJ tensor T by assumption, this is equivalent to the limit uh, of these things over, you know, F subset J. So yeah, this is where in the theorem we use this, you know, limit preservation property. Um, so, okay, well, I'm, uh, yeah. So I'm comparing two maps into this uh, limit. So, it's enough to show that the components, uh, I don't know why I marked this out, sorry about that. It's enough to show that their components uh, into like each, each finite component, each map into uh, this thing uh, agrees um, by the universal property of the limit. Uh, that's enough to show that the whole map is, uh, are, the whole maps are equal. So I have to show that, you know, this map, which is 
the, the finite component of the, the first map equals this map, which is the finite component of the second map for all finite subsets uh, uh, f of j. OK, well, that's what I assumed. Um, I mean, my assumption was that, uh, you know, like for any finite subset, the xj's are independent of the t. So, and that's exactly this if you rewrite these diagrams a little bit. Um, so, by assumption, this holds. So, we have the independence we're looking for. Okay, so now we can calculate. So, we start by, you know, we're trying to show that two maps are equal, right? By to show that uh, ps is deterministic. So we start by with this diagram where we have, you know, we copy the input and then we just run the PS thing two times. Um, well, the independence that we just showed means that, uh, you know, this part of the diagram where you copy something, use P on one side and P on the other side, and then S is the same thing as just using P once, uh, then copying the output and using S on that thing. So we can replace this you know, this component of the diagram with this other diagram. Um, and then S is deterministic. So we can like slide it past the, the copying uh, and get this. Okay, but this is exactly what it means that S composed with P is deterministic, right? It means that you can, you know, slide it past the, the copy like this. Okay, so this is the thing I wanted to prove. Now we're done. Uh, good job. Um, but uh, how does how does this relate to the classical theorem? I tried to say that a little bit while I was stating it, but let's write, put that on the slide just so we can see. All right, so how do I recover Kolmogorov's theorem from this? So I let C be the category Borel stock of uh, you know, Borel, standard Borel spaces. I let J be my natural numbers. Uh, and for each, I just let each XI be the real numbers. Um, so yeah, this is if I want real real value to random variables, which is how the theorem is usually stated. But of course, I mean, it could also be any other set here. And then I just let my A be a point, just a single time. And I let P be the joint distribution of my random variables, right? So a map from a single term to some space in ball stock is basically just a probability distribution on that space. And that's the probability distribution I want here, the joint distribution. And that's going to be independent in the right sense because by assumption, all my variables are independent. Then I let T be just a two point space and let's just call the two points zero and one. And S is the indicator function of the event E that I was uh, looking at. So this is like just the function out of the infinite product, which you know is deterministic. There's no randomness there. And it's one if the event happened and zero if the event uh, didn't happen. And the fact that the event is in the sigma algebra generated by the events means that this map is going to be measurable. Um, okay, and then, so if I compose S, S and P, and then, well, I mean, it's just a function out of a point, so you can just evaluate it. And this is going to be some distribution on zero to one. Um, and, you know, this is going to be the distribution where you sample from it by like, you know, generating all these random variables and then putting one if it's the event happened and zero if it didn't happen. So it's gonna be the distribution where the probability of one is the probability that the event happens. But of course, if SP is deterministic, then it's just a function from the point into zero and one. So it's just either constant zero or constant one. Um, so this means that either, you know, either the probability of one is zero or it's one. Um, so this recovers the classical theorem uh, so it, it doesn't quite recover the classical theorem, actually, because the classical theorem is also true. Uh, is also true. For like non standard Borel spaces. So this is like a little bit weaker than the classical version. Uh, so we can't prove quite as much as we'd like. Uh, and the problem, of course, is that if you we, we take, you know, any probability spaces in here, then the Komogorov product doesn't exist. Um, 
So yeah, we're still thinking a little bit about how to make this work in general, but it doesn't seem that this approach is gonna work. Okay, so yeah, that was about, uh, that was the, the Komogorov zero to one law. So it looks like there's still a, a bit of time left. So I think I'm also gonna tell you about the other theorem, namely the Hewitt-Savage zero to one law. Um, so yeah, this is the Hewitt-Savage zero to one law. Given a family of random variables, again, let's just call them VJ. Uh, and now it's really important that there's infinitely many um, and they should be independent and they should be identically distributed. So they should all be like, have the same distribution. And uh, given some event E, which is again in the sigma algebra generated by the variables. And so that's independent of finite permutations of the variables, then it either happens or it doesn't. But you know, either happens for probability one or probability zero. So an example of this could be something like if the event is you know, the i is zero for some i, then, I mean, of course, this event is not a tail event. And like, it, the, you can't use the Komogorov zero to one law here, because of course, if you might, like you can change whether there's a, a zero in the sequence by modifying, you know, only finitely many variables, right? You can just put a zero in one of the variables, but this is invariant on the permutations, right? If you swap the variables around, you're not changing whether there's a zero there. Okay, so um, how, uh, how can we prove this? So it turns out that to prove this theorem, we need a further assumption on our Markov category, uh, which I'm gonna explain now. So we say a Markov category is causal if whenever we have this equality, so uh, then we also have this equality for any like four maps, FG, H1, H2. So it's basically like this equality basically says that H1 and H2 are the same, like give the same distribution for any, like with probability one for any output that can be produced by F and G. And this basically says, well, if that is true, then it doesn't matter which one you use. And in particular, like it doesn't be like choosing a different one can't like go back in time and change the output of, of F or like the connection between the output of F and the output of G or something. Um, so this holds for all the examples that we've seen so far, but there are counter examples to this. Uh, so it turns out that we need this action to, to prove the theorem. Um, so now let me state the, the abstract version of the theorem. Um, so we have an object and now of course, you know, if our variables are gonna be uh, identically distributed, then they should also be you know, they, they have to take values in the same space. So we're just gonna take a Komogorov power of this object, just X, which I'm gonna write X to the J, which is just gonna be the Komogorov product of, you know, J many copies of X. And of course, like implicitly here, I'm assuming this exists. Then, uh, you know, any function Sigma from JJ is gonna act on this in a natural way. And informally we can write that action as like, you know, so you take, you know, an, an element of this product, again, informally speaking here, is like a, a J tuple of X's. And I'm gonna take that to the J tuple of X's given by where, like where the, the Jth coordinate is the F of J coordinate over here. Um, so yeah, so you have, for any function, it doesn't have to be like injective or subjective or anything. For any function, you have an action like this. Um, and I'm gonna denote it by Sigma hat from XJ to XJ. Um, and now I let you know P from A to XJ and S from A, X to XJ be maps that are, uh, so first of all, the X's are independent. And second of all, S is deterministic. So just as before, these are just like before, right? And third, so first of all, you know, the, the, all my X's are supposed to be identically distributed. So this means if I swap around the outputs using this Sigma, uh, after I do P, so for any finite permutation sigma, if I swap around the outputs using sigma, it doesn't change the distribution. And second of all, you know, S is supposed to be invariant under finite permutation. So this means if I swap around the inputs uh, before I use S, uh, it doesn't change uh, the outcome. Okay, so assume all this and suppose that C is causal. Then this composite SP is deterministic. 
Uh, okay, so how can we prove this? Now, these assumptions are pretty different. And in particular, we don't really have any independence assumption between uh, this T and the X's. So this seems a bit harder than the Komogorov, which it also is, which is, I mean, we do need another assumption, right? Um, but let's see what we can do. So I'm gonna start with this lemma. And this is a pretty like easy lemma, but I'm not gonna prove it because, uh, well, it would take too much time. Uh, so if we have uh, three maps, P, F, and G in our Markov category and our Markov category is causal and F is deterministic. The, and we have this equality where like the distribution, like if you, you know, use P to generate something, then use F on it and G on it, then that's the same thing as just using F on both sides. Then also, you know, F is equal to G for P almost everything which is basically what this diagram says. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna prove this, but it's pretty straightforward from the, the like it's a just a diagram manipulation. Um, but based on this lemma, we can, I'm gonna prove the theorem. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's sigma be any finite permutation. Then I'm gonna do this diagram rewriting. So like if I use P to uh, you know, generate something and then use sigma. So I, I, I compute S based on that. And then I also, you know, spit out the, the, the variables that the values of the variables that I computed, but I permuted them with sigma. Then of course, that's the same thing as if I also permuted them with sigma before using S because, you know, S sigma is just equal to S. Um, now sigma is deterministic. You can show that pretty easily. So I can slide this past the, bullet here. Um, and again, you know, it doesn't matter if I permute the variables after generating them because uh, they're identically distributed. So this is equal to this diagram. Okay, so this holds for any finite permutation sigma. Um, now I want to show that it also holds even if sigma is just an injection. So it doesn't have to uh, modify only finitely many variables. And it doesn't even have to be subjective, just an injective, this injection is fine. Okay, so here's the argument. So, you know, again, the Komorov power of J tensor T is a limit of finite powers. Um, so it's enough to show this after marginalizing with, you know, on some finite set F. So after projecting this, uh, this uh, left hand, you know, output to some finite set F. But you know, for any finite set F, I can find a uh, sigma prime from J to J, which is a finite permutation such that sigma prime acts like sigma on F, right? I can always, you know, you know sigma on F is, you know, injective. So uh, it's gonna send F to some equally sized subset of uh, J. And I always extend that to, uh, a, you know, a finite permutation of J. Um, and in particular, you know, if they act the same on F, then I can, you know, replace sigma prime or sigma with sigma prime in this diagram. And then it follows from the case where sigma is a finite permutation. So this holds, you know, in that larger generality. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty weird, right? It basically means I can throw away, you know, as almost as many of the coordinates as I like. That's really what you know. This does if this is not subjective. That's throwing away the variables that aren't in the image, and it doesn't change the distribution. Um, okay, so now let's rewrite. So I have you know let sigma again just be any injection. Then if I generate use uh, sigma on the, the left hand side, sigma hat on the left hand side, and compute s on the right hand side. Then what I just showed was that yeah that's equal to the, the case where we don't use sigma. So now uh, we have uh, like, if I use P, use sigma on the left-hand side and then compute, you know, S of the, the, the variables and S of the, well, not the permutation, but like the subset of the variables that I kept uh, using sigma, that's the same thing as just computing S twice. Um, and so my lemma, since S is deterministic, my lemma gives me that P sigma 
S is just the same, like is like sigma S is P almost certainly equivalent to uh, P S to, to, to S. Sorry. Um, okay, so this is sort of like I mean morally speaking, we're sort of done here because this sigma is like you know you can throw away as many variables as like as you like. You have to keep like a full cardinality of them, but apart from that, you can throw away as many variables as you like, and this says that doing that before you calculate S doesn't change the distribution. Um, okay, so that's, it seems as though that should mean S is completely independent of what the input is. Uh, and you know, it's always gonna give the same thing, which of course is what we want. Um, but you know, we still need to actually prove what we want using, you know, like in general. Uh, so let's do that now. And here's how we do it. So we let J, so, you know, we, we decompose J as a disjoint union of two subsets of equal cardinality to J. So J1 and J2 are disjoint subsets of J so that the union is all of J and each of J1 and J2 has the same cardinality as J. Uh, and here I have to use that J is infinite, obviously. Otherwise, uh, I can't do this. Um, then let T1 and T2 be uh, injections from J to itself with image J1 and J2. Um, so I can find that because J1 has the same cardinality as J. So you use some bijection from J to J1 and then the inclusion, right? Uh, then I have that if I, so I generate P, so I generate sort of J many X's. And then over here, I keep, basically I keep only the ones in J1 and Sort of re-index that to cover the whole thing. Here I do the same thing with the ones in J2. Uh, and then you can show that's the same thing as if I generate, like if I generated two different uh, copies of the X's and use those. And this falls to an independence. And like the, the moral here is that because J1 and J2 are disjoint and the variables are independent, it doesn't matter if I generate the variables twice and take the J1s over here and the J2s over here, or if I just generate the variables once because the variables are supposed to be independent. Um, all right. Um, okay, so now I can put everything together. Uh, you know, so say I generate P and compute S from that and copy the output. Well, S is deterministic, so uh, that's equal to this. Then uh, because of the thing I showed that, you know, for any injection, uh, S sigma uh, is equal to just uh, S, or rather is P almost certainly equal to S, I can put in uh, like S sigma one, I can put in tau one hat here and tau two hat here. Um, and then uh, I can, you know, because, you know, the bottom of this diagram is the diagram we just saw. So I can slide the piece up here uh, using that this uh, equality. Um, and now because, you know, P, uh, well, because, you know, S any injection is again, P almost certainly just S, I can delete these uh, injections again. And now I have PS, PS as I wanted. Okay, so that uh, finishes the talk. Uh, thank you so much for uh, listening. Uh, and I guess, I mean, I don't have to, uh, leave in five minutes. So now I'll take uh, as many questions as you have. Nice. Thank you so much for the talk. OK. Any questions or comments? Anybody? So in the meantime, I have a question. Great. So could you please go back to the Kolmogorov extension theorem? No, sorry, for the Kolmogorov 01 law. The, this one or the at classical the end. version? The let's go to the classical version. This one. Yeah. So yeah, it seems that uh no, maybe I think it was a, a slide that was a bit further on than that. Where you mentioned that apparently the, the traditional Kamragaras Jungle law holds for general like uh for general measurable space, however, the categorical version seems just to hold. Yes. Well, 
and the, um, the reason seems to be the Kolmogorov product, right? Well, yeah, so, so the, the Kolmogorov version doesn't even make sense without this notion of Kolmogorov product, right? And yes, exactly. I guess maybe the, yeah, so I'm, maybe I should say like one word about this. So you can, like, you can make sense of what this map, like what this data means, even if this product doesn't exist. Right. Because can you, you map can, it just to the diagram and some, as some kind of special natural transformation. Yeah, well, so you can, you can ask that this, like you can ask that, like, well, you can ask for like a collection of maps that satisfies the universal property of the limit, even if the limit doesn't exist. And that's like, you know, that's fine, such as it is. Uh, it's not clear that it gives the right thing if the extension theorem doesn't hold, but you know, you can do that. Uh, but the real problem is that you can't do this if you don't, like if you can't point at some object in your category and say, this is the infinite product. And I want a map out of that that like tells me whether my event happened or not, uh, then you can't make sense of this part. Uh, so, 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 so you really need some sort of infinite product. Um, I see, I see. And right. yes, so I guess the, the problem here is that the, you know, the, the infinite product that you want, like, of course, you, you, you know what the infinite product should be in like general measurable spaces. It should be the infinite product of the underlying measurable spaces with the product sigma algebra um, but it doesn't have a universal property, or at least not an obvious universal property in, in that category. So there's no like categorical way of pointing at it. So you could like, one, one thing you could do is you could like ask for infinite product as part of, part of the structure, but then it's not obvious what structure, like what action should the infinite product satisfy to make this reasonable. I see. So in particular for general, for general measurable spaces, yes. the infinite product, like the infinite sigma algebra of the product, how do I say? Sigma algebra of the infinite product does not, so it cannot be written as this co-filtered limit of the final yes, ones. Is this exactly. The... Yeah, exactly. And basically, well, yes, more or less. So basically, uh, yeah, well, I don't know exactly that too, but yeah, definitely this limit doesn't hold in. So I think this limit, okay, so this limit holds, like you do have, let me go to, uh, uh, yeah, let me go to a blank page here. Mm -hmm. Like you do have limb, like, you know, product of xi, i in f, f equals product i in j, x i in the category of measurable spaces um, i'm sorry who are f and j here so you know f subset j finite like just as before right j and, oh and so you also you also take the, the you also take the the limit over f i suppose yeah so that's that's what i'm doing here um so you like in oh measurable i see spaces, i see i see i see so in measurable spaces this is like unproblematic and true just because this is like well in any category with where this product exists, it's going to be a, a, a covalent limit of its finite subproducts. Mm -hmm. um, but this doesn't hold in stock because the like the, because the Kolmogorov extension theorem is false in general. So like this universal property mm -hmm. is going to stop being true once I you know allow sort of random maps into these things. So in, like in particular, there exists there exist, you know, uh, XJ, like a family XJ and maps like from the point to like, you know, all the finite products. Well, so I guess I should write these as tensors since this is in stock. Well, oh, sorry, that was, that was highlighting. Um, to, mm -hmm like distributions on all the finite products that are compatible. But do not admit a lift to like the infinite. Oh, now I'm writing this product again, like the infinite uh, product of these. So like the 
you can't always extend a family of like finite joint measures to an infinite joint measure. I see. Um, but you can do that if your probabilities, like if your measurable spaces aren't too generate. And I think it's not like, you know, it's it wouldn't be too weird to just say that like a, you know, a probability space that not standard borel is just like, you know, too pathological to really expect things to work nicely. Um, yeah, I completely but, agree with that statement. <laughs> so so it maybe isn't too big of a loss. Uh, I completely agree. I mean, yeah, in the end, um, uh, there's a lot of traditional probability theory, I mean, non-categorical, that only works for standard yeah, spaces so, anyway. Exactly. So. So, so, so it's not too big of a loss. Uh, I think, you know, the, the original statement of this theorem is also for like real, real valued random uh, variables, where of course, like the, the real numbers are standard Borel. Uh, sure. Right. Right. Very nice. Thank you. We have another question by David Tieter. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. So uh, you should be unmuted and feel free to ask your question. Uh, I've, I've, I've sat through the talk thinking about, of, all right, um, co, uh, every, every object has a, a co-algebra structure. Sure. And of course, I've, I've thought a lot about things in which just things act are ordinary co-algebras in the classical sense. And I was wondering, the, the condition that the um, monoidal identity be terminal might, I think it would probably require some kind of pointedness condition. But I was trying to think yes. whether one could come up with an example like in which you had just some, some kind of po pointed co-algebras over a field and yeah. arbitrary linear maps between them and then the deterministic maps by definition would be so, the co-algebra homomorphisms. Is, yes. is there a, is there a stock different. example like that? Yeah, so you can definitely do that. So like for any, for any monoidal category, any, uh, you know, I'm gonna call it C tensor unit, uh, like co-algebras in C, oh, sorry, let me see, you know, co-algebras in C, uh, well, so like we have a category where the objects are co-algebras in C, but the maps like are unital maps or co-unital maps, I guess. Uh, uh -huh. Co-unital maps. Uh, and that's going to be an example. Okay. Uh, and maybe so I think, I don't know if this is written down anywhere, but it's definitely going to be an okay. example. But the, maybe the, what is written down somewhere is that you can do the dual thing where you take the opposite of a category of algebras and unital maps. Uh, and that's like, I think, you know, in my, maybe not in this paper, but in some of the other papers about Markov categories, we spent some time like working out the details of, of those examples. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> We have another question by Tim. Tim, again, if you want, you can unmute yourself and sure. ask. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it was just, it's a very naive question, but just you spend a lot of time talking about, you know, infinite Kolmogorov products and kind of, you know, limits and stuff like this. Is there any useful notion of co-products here? Like, are these um, things you care about? So, well, that's a very good question. Um, so generally speaking, uh, the co-products are going to be sort of just like what you expect, like just the, you know, the co-products in the deterministic category are also going to be co-products in the, uh, in the like stochastic category. Um, so like, you know, X plus Y in like in, 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 stoch in stock is just like the disjoint union of measurable spaces. Uh, of measurable spaces like uh, with some sort of obvious sigma algebra and so on. And like the general reason for this is that like a lot of Markov categories are sort of like basically in a Markov category, you're saying I'm going to, you know, my maps from X to Y are going to be maps from X to like some like probability like space of distributions and I. So like a lot of Markov categories are like Kleisley categories of probability monads. Uh, and of course, in something like this, then the, you know, the, like the, the then the, like the co-products are just gonna be the, or, or and the co-limits in general are gonna be the ordinary co-limits. 
um, right? Because like a map from a map from you know x plus y to p y is 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 going to be the same thing as a map from x to p y. Sorry, not p x, not y. Maybe set here, and the map from set to p y. Does that make sense? That like basically a map in a market, like we're somehow doing something weird to the codomain, but not the domain of the map. Uh, so generally, yeah. Please. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, since that, yep. this answers the question. So Tim, yeah, Tim said that he muted himself by accident. Oh, okay. okay. But it does answer right. the question. Great. Very good. All right, are there any more questions or comments? I had one. I'll, um, mm -hmm. I don't know if this is... So So I, I just happened to notice that I think I, I found a functor or that, that takes any category and returns... Sorry, any monoidal category and returns a Markov category. Sure. Kind of like the one you did, had there with co-algebras, but it was, um, I was calling para. Sure. So it's like parameterized maps. Right. So a map from X to Y would be like a set P or an object P, maybe an object that, that who, with, whose map to the terminal is, is an epi um, and a map from P times X to Y. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Something like this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, so it's kind of like my dice, my, my randomness is this other dice that like right. P is like the dice, right? But yeah, and I guess you compose by tensoring the, the parameter. The P's, yeah. Oh, uh, but you consider two of them the same if there is a surjective map from P to P prime. All right. Or epimorphic um, from P to P prime. Um, right. Diagram commute. Um, and that, that seems to satisfy all your properties. Yes. Well, well, how do you, so you need this to be Cartesian, right? If you're going to have co-diagonals. Co or sorry, if you're going to have diagonals. Oh yeah, the, the co-diagonal has P equal one. Well, yeah, but you still need the underlying monoidal category to be Cartesian, right? Like, ah, there we go. I you see. need a map from P, yeah. Um, I think that works though. Um, and I think, so we have in the, the new paper that I mentioned, I think we have something about like parameterized markup categories. Although there, I think we look at like a fixed parameter object, mm. not like one that varies. Um, but I think in general, like parity of a markup category, mar C markup should give you mm. this markup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But even uh, if C is just set or something, it's then good. Right, right. So you can apply this to a Cartesian category and get something yeah. that's not Cartesian. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I checked what deterministic means, and it means the right thing, but I couldn't tell what independent meant. So. Right, OK. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, I think, well, that's in, it's interesting to think about this. I don't think we've really explored that idea. Um, I think something similar to that, I don't know if it's quite like exactly like this, but it's similar, is given by the work of Dan Schiebler. Uh, mm. At least for the R and Ks and for the, for the case of uh, uh, Cartesian spaces. He has this paper, Categorical Stochastic Process and Likelihood, that explores a little bit of this idea and proves that this, at least a, a construction very similar to what David pointed out, Satisfies oh, the actions of uh, of Markov category. There was a talk about it on ICT. Sorry, I don't need my thing to be Cartesian, do I, Igo? Because well, I just take I. I just take I when. Um... Well, what's the map from X? Like, you know, the map from X tensor X to X tensor X is going to be a map from X tensor yeah. P for some Sorry. P <laughs> to X tensor X. You're right. You're right. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I guess you could. Well. I mean, no, I no, think no. You, you could put X here, but that's definitely not going to satisfy oh, the yeah. terms. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Great. Um, sorry, Paolo, you were saying like... I remember there was a talk at uh, ACT and there even maybe the... I don't know if it was on a talk with the preprints or not, but I mean, for sure it's it's ongoing research. So at some point, there's going to be a paper uh, of Dan Schibler that... Mm at least reminded me of what you said. I don't know if it's exactly mm -hmm. the same, but 
cool. seems to be closely related for the case of Cartesian spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions or any more comments for Idle? Tim has another one, sure. Uh, feel free to uh, mute yourself and ask. Hey, sorry. Um, again, so I don't know, maybe this question is, is not fully sensical, but you mentioned that the, the kind of construction you're looking at looks like a Kleisley category. You know, you go from X into P of Y and stuff like this. Yeah. And then there's this other conversation talking about this kind of parameterized idea. Is this kind of just like the algebra version as opposed to the Kleisley category version? Or is, um, do you gain something from looking at like the... Oh yeah, so, so that's, hmm. I don't think it is. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, uh i think i'm not like i'm not sure but i don't think like so you know that you can look at the like you know the algebras of this distribution or you know probability mode instead yeah um but you don't i don't think this really i mean i don't think this is a markup category in general um okay yeah uh i think in particular I'm not sure that you know the the monoidal structure extends to this in the right way. Okay. Um, well, I'm not 100 percent on that. Uh, okay. okay. Thanks. Nice. Okay. Anybody else? Doesn't see so we have some things and some smileys on YouTube too. Um, okay, so I feel like we can uh, we can stop the online discussion now. So thanks a lot, Igil, for a nice talk and for the very good work.